Now, chapter 3 in 2 Corinthians is a very powerful chapter. And so we're going to be looking at chapter 3, verses 6 through 18, actually 7 through 18 today, as we continue our verse-by-verse study through the, uh, the book of 2 Corinthians. So allow me to begin reading here in uh, 2 Corinthians at uh, chapter 3, verse 7. I'll read the chapter to you, and we'll get into our study. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning at verse 7. Paul writes, If the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. And therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And so, as I've been doing every time we uh, get together here, I'll give you a brief review to see what what Paul has been saying up to this point, and then to pick up at verse 7. We know that Paul, in 2 Corinthians, when you read this book, you'll see this, we know that Paul has been responding to gossip, gossip that has been spread about him. There are false teachers that have entered into the church there in Corinth, and they are disseminating uh, gossip uh, intended to divide the church, to take their hearts away from the Apostle Paul. And when you go through this, it's interesting to note that uh, the problems that he deals with and he addresses here in 2 Corinthians uh, are not all theological in nature. Many of them fall under the category of simply personal attacks on the Apostle Paul. And we've seen that uh, so far many times. As we've gone through this epistle from chapter 1, chapter 2, now into chapter 3, we've seen that they have made accusations. They've said that he is, he is selfish or that he's insincere, that he changes his mind easily. We've seen that they have said that he is self-appointed and he's unloving, that he's legalistic and greedy. They, they said he was unrecognized by the leaders of the church, that he labored in the flesh. These are all personal attacks on the Apostle Paul. Now, many times we may look at Paul and, and others who are solidly mature and faithful in the Lord. We, we may look at them and think that they aren't affected by what's said. But fact is, is the things that were being said about Paul actually had a wounding effect on him. Uh, we saw him as he, he wrote and and, and he shared with them concerning this. In 2 Corinthians, we saw it in chapter 2, verse 4, when he said, Out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote to you, with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. And so these things did affect him, and he tells them, affliction, anguish of heart, many tears. I'm not saying this so you'll be guilty, I just want you to know how much I love you. And so Paul had been affected to the point that he's writing a response to the things that are being said. You see, they're questioning Paul. They're they're questioning his credentials. They're they're asking questions like, who gave him this authority that he's wielding? They're asking questions uh, about the proof of his ministry. Now, he had made it clear that, that the fact that there was a church in Corinth actually validated him as a minister. He said, His letter of recommendation was, in fact, them and their changed lives. In his teaching, God's word had been engraved in their hearts. It revealed their salvation. And the church was, in fact, his letter of commendation. They were the ones who authorized his ministry. 
So in answer to the slur that he labored in the flesh, Paul was making it clear he did not. Remember verse 5 here in chapter 3, how that he said, we're not sufficient of ourselves to think anything of being of ourselves. Our sufficiency is from God. So Paul knew that, that he wasn't adequate in and of himself. He knew that without Jesus, he could not accomplish a single thing that was good. He wasn't adequate in and of himself. And he knew it. And he acknowledged it openly. He, he made it clear that it takes God to make us adequate to serve God. And, and it takes God to empower us to be able to do so faithfully. That's why he wrote, our sufficiency is from God. So he's giving his defense. He's saying, my abilities are not natural ones. They've been spiritually imparted to me. In verse 6, he said, it's, it's God who made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. Jesus saved him. And Jesus is the one who equipped him the way he saved you and he equips you. And he equips you to serve. In 1 Timothy 1.12, uh, he had said, I, I, thank, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. And that's what Paul would say. Now, who were these people, once again, who were these who were creeping in and sowing seeds of discord, who were trying to undermine the work that he was doing? Who were these people? Well, they're identified as, as Jewish infiltrators in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty two, 22, because he says there, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. And that's why he's speaking about the Old Covenant. It appears that they're bringing in a mixture of Jewish legalism and trying to mix it up with grace. And, and that may be why Paul spoke of the New Covenant in contrast to what is called the Old Covenant, the New Testament versus the Old Testament. He speaks of the Old Covenant in this way. In verse 7, he says it's a ministry of death. In, in verse 9, he speaks of it as being the ministry of condemnation. You see, the old covenant was a lifeless code that required perfect obedience. And if you didn't keep the law, you came under judgment. In the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 11, verses 3 and 4 writes, Say to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Cursed is the man who does not obey the words of this covenant which I commanded your fathers in the day I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice. And do according to all that I command you. So shall you be my people and I will be your God. Cursed is the man who does not obey. He said, obey my voice. Do all that I command you. That means you will be my people. And so the Old Testament was a letter of condemnation, a ministry of death. Because nobody could keep all of the law perfectly. And that's why in verse 6 Paul made it clear the letter kills but the spirit gives life. You see, the letter of the law, the law of Moses, reveals our sinfulness, our complete lost and hopeless condition. That's what it does. But in contrast to the judgment found in the law, in Jesus, the riches of grace are revealed because God wrote the law on tablets of stone, but God brings his grace and writes, them on tab writes it on tablets of heart. In Jeremiah 31, 33, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. And so we were seeing that last time we were together as we went through chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And Paul is continuing now to build on what he's been saying here in verses 7 following. So in verse 7 and 8, he continues by saying, if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? And so we remember that when Moses went to the mountain to receive the law, we remember how the Bible tells us that, that God's presence there was extremely glorious. In, in Exodus in chapter 19, verse 16, it says, It came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain, and the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. 
And so as they saw this taking place up there in that mountain, and, and they, they, the thunderings and, and the lightnings and, and all of that, the presence of the Lord, it caused them to tremble. And that's what he's speaking about. He's speaking about in the law, there was a glory being revealed. Later in the book of Exodus, Moses received the law and the people could not look steadily at him. In Exodus 34, 29 and 30, it says, When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, in his hands he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. And so that's what he's referring to. The ministry of death, verse 7, written and engraved on stones. The commandments that Moses received. He says it was glorious. The children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory, he says, was passing away. Notice how he says the glory was passing away. In other words, the radiance of Moses' countenance faded because it wasn't permanent. The law was glorious, but it ultimately resulted in death to man. And that's because the law of Moses actually brings knowledge of sin and judgment. We saw that last time we were together. I would not have known covetousness except that the law said, Thou shalt not covet, and it awakened all manner of covetousness within me, is what Paul would say. So the law was glorious, but it resulted in death because it brings knowledge of sin and ultimately brings knowledge of of judgment. And so as he's speaking of that, he, he contrasted in verse 8 by saying, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? If the law of Moses resulted in death, it makes sense that grace is more glorious. The Spirit giving us life and filling us and teaching us and leading us, the Spirit of God, and that's more glorious. You see, the law informed us from the inside, we would, we would hear it, in other words, and it would speak to us somehow inside. But the Spirit actually is in us now in a different way and leads us from the inside. The law, in a sense, was actually impacting us, but it was not as the Spirit's work is because it was only on the outside stirring us from the inside, but the Holy Spirit now from the inside stirs us to do that which God has revealed to us through his word. So in John's gospel, speaking of this, John gives us insight in, into how the, the spirit works in our lives because notice again in verse 8, he asks the question, will the ministry of the spirit not be more glorious? So I want to share with you a few things about that, the ministry of the spirit. I can't give to you an entire Bible study on that one subject, but I'll give you some things to think about because guess what? As Christians, it's important for us to know that. There are a lot of Christians today that I encounter who are not walking in victory, who are not walking in the sense of liberty that God wants to give to us, who aren't walking in power. Many of them are, are very discouraged and, and even fearful about a variety of things. And, and I, I think it's important for us to, to remember what, what the work of the Holy Spirit really is, guys, because you're not a Christian if the Holy Spirit doesn't dwell within you. You're just a religious person. When you give your heart to Christ and you're born again, the Holy Spirit takes up residence within you. You become the temple of the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God lives in you. The Spirit who raised Christ from the dead gives life to your mortal body. God's Holy Spirit has taken residence in you. At one time, His Spirit would meet with men in that temple made with human hands. He would meet volitionally. He chose to meet in the temple. He, ch he chose to meet with the, the children of Israel in the tabernacle. But when Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, resurrected, ascended into heaven, He sent to us the Holy Spirit. This Holy Spirit is not just a concept. He's a person, and He dwells inside of you. And so the law that is on the outside, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not commit adultery, and all of those laws that we know in the commands, those laws are written in our hearts, and the Holy Spirit now makes it something we prefer doing. And so it's not that we're trying to obey things from the outside. What we're trying to do is obey the Spirit on the inside and to do those things that are pleasing to Him. The Spirit is more glorious than the law, and that's the point He's making. 
You see, John gives us insight concerning this. He, he helps us to understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit and how the work of the Spirit is more glorious. Again, the law was written on tablets of stone, but the Spirit resides within us. When you look at John's Gospel, when you look at chapter 14, chapter 14 of, of John's Gospel records the last night that Jesus spent ministering to his disciples. He'd been with them for around three years. They were, they were dependent on him, and on that night, he, he broke bread with them. He reminded them that he was about to leave them. He, he told them, you will soon be without my physical presence. But though they are without his physical presence, they still need him. They need his help. And so with that in mind, he made a promise to them. In John 14, verses 16 and 17, he said, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So he said to them in John 14, 16, I will pray the Father, he will give you what he refers to as another helper. Those are the words he chooses to use. When he speaks about another helper, there are two different Greek words that are translated by the single word another, another. One of those words is the Greek word alas, A-L-L-O-S, alas. It speaks of another of the same substance, essence, and quality. It speaks of something that is the same kind, another, is something of the same kind, same substance, essence, and quality. There's a different word that can be translated another, and that's the word heteros. And heteros uh, speaks of a different sort or a different kind. Well, Jesus said that he would give another helper, another comforter. In the Greek, that's alos parakletos, and that means another comforter or another helper. In other words, he's saying the Holy Spirit will be like me. He will have my nature. The Holy Spirit will provide for you the help that you need from me, is what he is saying. And so Jesus made a promise that the Holy Spirit, another helper, the comforter, would be within us. It would be his presence by the Spirit in our lives. And so that gives us insight into why the ministry of the Holy Spirit is more glorious. On our own, we're consistent failures. We cannot walk in a way that consistently pleases Him. We know what the Lord requires of us. We simply don't have the ability to be pleasing to Him at all times. In Romans seven eighteen, Paul said it like this. He said, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. I want to do what is good. I have the desire but I don't have the ability to perform that which I desire. In Matthew 26, 41, Jesus said it like this. He said, watch and pray so that you, you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And it is, isn't it? Our flesh is weak. There are things that you do that you wish you didn't do, don't want to do necessarily, but you end up doing. The spirit is willing. I want to do something for the Lord. The flesh is weak. So I need the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. And so Paul is speaking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And he said it's more glorious than that old covenant. Why is it more glorious? Well, because the Holy Spirit remains with us. And he gives us the ability to live for him and to please him. Remember your Bible. Remember in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would descend on someone and then would depart. That occurs, for example, in the life of Samson. Samson uh, was rebelling against the things of the Lord, and the Spirit of God departed from him, according to Judges 16, 20. This awareness of the Spirit being removed is found in, in the Psalms. In Psalm 51, 11, the, uh, rather the prophet uh, teacher King David said, Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. So there was an awareness that the Spirit would descend, do his work, but would also depart. And David didn't want the Spirit departing from him. So the Bible teaches us now in the New Testament that, that the Spirit of God empowers us to live for God and remains with us. 
We saw in John 14, 16, Jesus said, the Spirit will abide with us forever. And so there's the work of the Holy Spirit as he dwells within you. It's more glorious than the law because the Spirit is within us. He dwells in us. When you're going through times of struggle and temptation, when you're going through fear, I know it's difficult to, to do what I'm about to say, and I don't always succeed, but it doesn't make it not true. That's when, we, that's when we need the most to turn to the Lord and say, God, help me. God, help me. Because sometimes there are, the, your flesh gets in the way and, and you're going to respond in a way that you don't want to. You're going to say something you don't want to do. Or to say or you may do something you don't want to do. God, help me. You know, I, I, I never really realized that driving could be a form of trials. I, 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 didn't, I never realized that, but it is. And sometimes I'm sitting there praying Old Testament prayers. Kill them, oh God. <laughs> Break their teeth. Scatter my enemies. I'm late. You know, I, I pray. <laughs> and that's when I awaken to the fact that I'm, I'm a flesh, I'm a man. And God knows my frame. He knows that I'm flesh. It's no surprise to him. And, and as I walk closer to the Lord over time, I, I am more and more dependent on him, more and more realizing that without him I can do nothing. And we need to pray, and we need to seek the Lord. We need to be aware that, that the Holy Spirit is with us, and, and he's not going to leave us. Jesus said the Spirit will abide with us forever, and that is greater than the law. Another thing that makes the ministry of the Spirit more glorious is, is that he teaches us. He's the one who internally teaches us. In, in John 14, 26, uh, Jesus said, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. In John 16, 14, he went on to say, he will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. So Holy Spirit works within us and he teaches us as we read the word of God. It's the Holy Spirit who takes these words on this page and imprints them in our heart as we receive these words in faith. And it transforms us as we put these things into practice. A, a third thing that makes this work more glorious, he guides us. He guides us into all truth. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, gives us discernment. He internally guides us to be able to recognize deception. In John 16, 13, Jesus said, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. You see, because spiritual deception is so rampant, the Holy Spirit gives us discernment. As you're reading your Bible, he teaches you, he can instruct you. As it's being taught to you, he gives you discernment to know whether these things are so, whether these things are true, whether these things line up with what you know Scripture to have taught. It's the Holy Spirit who does that. He, he gives you that insight. When I first got saved, I've said this before, but it comes to mind when I think of this subject. When I first got saved, I, I was being taught the Bible. I was told, read the Bible, so I did. And I was reading, uh, I had a, uh, a Bible that I would read every night. I, I was reading through the Bible, and, and uh, as I was reading it, I was growing to understand some things of the Lord. And I was at a friend of mine's house, and as I was at his house, he, he had hired a guy to come and do some work in the house. And so this guy was doing some work, and I, I walked up to him. And I'm, I'm a brand new Christian, and so I was told, when you get saved, tell somebody about Jesus. And I wanted to tell him. I didn't know this guy. And so I wanted to tell him about the Lord, but I, I didn't know much. I just wanted to tell him a couple of things. So I started a conversation with him, and I asked him, uh, I, do, you, uh, do you have a faith of any sort? Just a conversation like that. And he says, oh, yeah, I do. And I said, really, really? So I'm thinking, you know, what, kind, what, what do you believe in? So I asked him, I said, well, what, what is your faith? What do you believe in? He says, I'm, I'm part of, and he, he said this, I'd never heard of this before. He said, I'm part of the Self-Realization Fellowship. And, and I, I, some of you may be familiar with it. I, I wasn't at that time. I'd never heard of it, Self-Realization Fellowship. So I said, what is that? 
And he says, oh, we believe in the teachings of all the great masters like Muhammad and like Buddha and Confucius and, uh, and Jesus. I said, oh, do you believe in Jesus? Because he said Jesus. Now, again, I'm like two weeks old in Christ. So what do I know? So I said, oh, really? I said, you believe? Now, I'm a brand new believer. I'm 20 years old. I'm fresh from the drug scene, the alcohol scene, and everything that went along with that. I'm certainly no Bible scholar of any sort. I'm just learning to read the Bible. But it didn't make sense to me. So I said, now, let me ask you a question, if I may. He goes, of course. I said, y you believe everything that, that Buddha said? Yeah. And you believe everything Confucius said? He said, yeah, and uh, you believe the, the Hindu teachings, you know? And he said, yeah. I said, really? I said, but, but Je and you believe what Jesus said? And it was a real question. I wasn't trying to argue. I, I was just confused. How can you say that? So I said, do you believe what Jesus said too? And he says, yes, I do. Every, every master gave truth. And I said, okay. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. I said, now, if Jesus said no man comes to the Father but by me, how can you believe what Confucius said? And how can you believe what Buddha said? And how can you believe what Muhammad said? And how can you believe what Krishna said when Jesus said no one comes to me, uh, to the Father, except by me? How's that work? And he thought I was arguing. I wasn't. I was curious. H how do you believe something that's obviously illogical? How do you believe that? Explain your faith to me. Because if Jesus said, I'm the way, no one comes to the Father but by me, and Buddha gave claims and he, all the rest, how's that work? He thought I was arguing, and I wasn't. I was too stupid to argue. I was just like, what? How's that work? I don't know how that works. You see, what happens when you come to faith in Christ the Holy Spirit gives you a discernment, an awareness that you may not even be aware that you have. When you gave your heart to Christ, he said, I will guide you into truth. You said, God, come into my life, Jesus. You picked up the Bible. You start to read it. And the Lord begins to imprint his word on the tablet of your heart. And so you speak into somebody who says, oh, I believe Jesus, but I really don't. And that's why you'll say, why don't you, if you say you do? It's not because you're fighting. It's because that doesn't make sense. But how come it doesn't make sense? It does make sense because the Holy Spirit is awakening you and saying, uh, just letting you know, this doesn't make sense. And you say, thank you, Jesus, because it doesn't. I was confused. It, it may seem, seem simplistic, and I'm certain it does to some, but it's true. Jehovah's Witness knocked on my door. I was first saved. Start telling me things. And I looked at him. I'm, I'm not two weeks old in Christ. I'm still young. And I'm saying, I don't think I agree with what you're saying. I don't think that that's true. I I'm, don't want to argue with you. I'm not here to fight with you. This is my house. You knocked on my door. But I don't want you to think I'm arguing with you. I just, and I smiled. I still remember smiling. I, I just don't think you're right. I don't agree with you. Where did I get that from? The Holy Spirit. See, there are things that you'll hear sometimes and you'll just go, no, wait a minute. There's something wrong with that. That's the discernment the Spirit gives you. Jesus promised that to us. He spoke to us and he said that the Holy Spirit would teach us and he would also guide us into truth. Again, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he'll guide you into all truth. Spiritual deception is rampant, so he gives us discernment. And he does that primarily by his spirit and his word. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And then again, what makes the work of the Spirit more glorious? He leads us into a deeper love for Jesus Christ. In Romans 8, 15, Paul said it like this. You did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, 
but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So we are brought into the family of God and we love the Lord Jesus Christ. I've met people who have told me, even before they're saved, they would say, oh, I love Jesus. No, you don't know him. You're in love with someone you don't even know. Kind of like romances on Facebook. You don't know him. How could you be in love with him? But when you're introduced to Christ, everything about him becomes more glorious. You, 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 you actually have a love for him that is deep and passionate. And it drives you in everything that you do. And so the ministry of condemnation that he's speaking about was the, was the law. The ministry of death was the law. And so he says in verse 9, if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. The ministry of condemnation revealed the judgment that awaits the lost. The judgment on those who sinned served to exalt God's holiness. But the gospel message exalts Jesus and reveals grace. And that brings greater glory to God. The ministry of righteousness is faith in Jesus that results in righteousness. He says in verse 10, for even what was more, for even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passed in a way was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. The law has lost its glory because it's been overshadowed by the glory of grace. That reminds us of, of Jesus and his transfiguration. Remember, he went to a, a high mountain, and, and the Bible says he was transfigured before Peter, James, and John. According to Matthew 17, 2, it says his face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. And there were two there with him, Moses and Elijah, and they were speaking to Jesus. And, and Matthew makes it clear that Jesus' glory excelled the glory of, of Moses and Elijah, it excelled the glory of the law and the prophets. And then he says in verse 11, he says, what is passing away was glorious. What remains is much more glorious. You see, the ministry of grace that produces righteousness excels the ministry of condemnation. The law wasn't written on hearts, and the spirit was not yet given. So this makes God's grace more glorious than the law of Moses. And as he says that, therefore, verse 12, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. And so he speaks here in verse 12 and, and says, we have hope. And because we have hope, we have great boldness of speech. The word hope speaks of a, of a confident expectation. It speaks of confidence. We have confidence. And he's saying that our ministry is grounded in the grace of God's gospel. We know that we've been equipped by God. And because we know that, we confidently preach His grace. You see, when you know what you're saying is true, your confidence is greater. I got saved. And uh, again, uh, there was a boldness that I had. I, I, as, as a hippie, I, as a hippie, I didn't have a confidence in anything. Hippies, uh, you know, we, we, those of you who are younger and don't, don't, aren't aware of them, the, the hippies, we had a... Uh, a philosophy that, you know, just live and let live. You know, just, it, it's, it, we see it in its, its, its more mature form now. But at that time, it, it, you know, if you want to believe this, believe it. I don't care. I'm not going to argue with you about it. You want to do that, do it. I don't care as long as it doesn't hurt me. And that was basically my philosophy of life. And so whatever you said was fine with me. I never cared about your opinion anyway. It didn't matter. If you like this, fine. You like that, fine. I don't care. I won't argue with you. It don't, doesn't matter. And then I got saved. And when I got saved, I started praying a prayer in my early days of walking with Christ that I still remember. I used to say to the Lord, give me a spine. I would pray that, Father, give me a spine. Give me, give me boldness. Give me courage. Give me confidence. Give me strength. I don't want to be like a willow just blowing with the wind and moving here and moving there with every wind of doctrine. I, I want to be solid. I want to have a spine. I want to stand up for something. I want to be counted for something. I, I don't want to just kind of float. Any, any dead fish can float down a stream. You know, Lord, I want to be a living fish and go against it. I want strength. And I would pray that. I pray that a lot. I still do. God, give me confidence. Give me strength. Give me boldness. 
I want to speak truth. I want to speak it with love, but I want to speak it with authority. So God, in Jesus' name, give me something to believe in. Because coming out of the hippie background that I was, I didn't believe in anything. Now I'm reading the Bible, and now I'm saying, God, fill me with the confidence that this is true. And I discovered something that you've discovered too. If you haven't, you can. And that is this. This, this word is living. It is God's sword, and God uses it, and he, he can strengthen you through it, and he gives you wisdom by it, and he uses you to declare it, and God uses you to see people get saved. Their lives will be transformed when you hold fast to it. So you ask God for strength, and, and guess what? I mean, it's true. I mean, I, I, I've said this too many times recently, but it's true, especially in my early days. Um, God, I just want to speak it. I just want to share it. I want to know it. And, and I don't want to back down or be embarrassed by it. It's your word. I, it's, your, it's your word. And I believe with every beat of my heart that you have the ability not only to give it, but to use people to give it. So I ask you to use me to give out your word. And that's what you do. And you have a confidence. This is God's word. And, and oh, not everybody, you know, not everybody's going to say, once you open it there, not everybody's going to say, oh, how profound, how deep. I wish I knew that. No, people will mock you. People will say things to you. People don't believe this is God's word. I understand that. But that doesn't mean it isn't God's word. It simply means that people have a lack of faith and don't understand it. My, my God, our God, is capable of, preserving, pre, of preserving his word for us. He inspired me to write it for us so we would know his mind. And so you preach his word, not your opinions or the latest thing, but his word. And because God writes it on the tablet of your heart and you have a hope, you have a great confidence and a boldness of speech. And it comes out that way. Now, some people may think that you're arrogant and and maybe sometimes we can be. But they shouldn't confuse confidence with arrogance. This is God's word. And I've had my com conversations with people. And they're not always kind. And sometimes they're... I was sitting on a train going to London. And a woman sits next to me, an American. She was from Massachusetts. And I, she just visits. She's starting to visit with me. Marie was seated with me and all. This woman was friendly. And I said, oh, American, what are you doing in England? Oh, she goes, I, I, I sing in bars. I said, oh, you do? Really? She goes, yeah. She says, I sing dirty little songs to men in bars. I said, oh. <laughs> Don't sing one to me, but okay. <laughs> And I mean, she's just very open. I mean, very open about it. And I'm just sitting there. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not condemning her, not judging her. I'm just talking to her. Lots of people do things. So she looks at me after sharing these things with me, and she says to me, and what do you do? <laughs> I said, uh, I'm a pastor. I hate it when people preach to me. She tells me that. I hadn't said a word to her. I hadn't said a word. She goes, I hate it when people, no, not preach. I hate it when people shove their religion down my throat, is what she said. And I looked at her and I said, really? She goes, yeah. I said, but you can shove yours down mine. And she says, what? I haven't shoved my, when have I shoved my religion down your throat? I said, your religion is shoved down my throat 24 hours a day, seven days a week. She goes, when is my... I said, every time I turn on a television, I see your religion. Every time I see a magazine, I see your religion. Every time I listen to a song on the radio, I hear your religion. Your religion is shoved down my throat 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days out of the year, and you're telling me I shove my religion down your throat? She got quiet, but it's true. But it's true. The world shoves the religion down your throat 24-7. So I, 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 I'm not a bully. It sounds like I am, huh? I, I, I'm not. But when you say something to me, 
Don't expect me to sit there going, oh, that was words from Sinai, you're so wise. If it's dumb, I'll let you know. We'll have a talk. Sometimes we have great conversations after the ice is broken like that, you know. Not with her, but there have been others. Where do you get your confidence from? Where do you get it from? From the Word of God. The power of the Holy Spirit. His Word is true. And God has given it to us. He's entrusted it to us. Entrusted it to us to share it with other people. Why? Because it's the only message that God ever gave that saves people's souls from hell. And that's why we preach the Word of God out of love for people. That's why. It's not because we're bullies and it's not because we're angry. No, we have this hope. And he says that since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. So he says, unlike Moses, it speaks of the glory that was revealed in the face of Moses. It was only temporary. It faded away. But God's glory is not lifted from believers. He says in verse 14, their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains uh, unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because a veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So hardness to Jesus has resulted in spiritual blindness on the part of Israel. The veil represents unbelief. They didn't grasp the glory because of unbelief. And like the Israel in the Old Testament, the Jews of his day remained hardened to the gospel. But when they come to a saving knowledge of Jesus as Messiah, he says, the veil is then removed. In John 1.17, it says, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The veil is removed. When we go to Israel... We don't always get what are called messianic guides. We don't always get guides who are believers in Christ. We get great guides. But many of them aren't believers in Jesus. I'm asked that whenever we go to Israel. I'm asked by people who are going on the trip, is our guide a believer? And sometimes they're not. They're very respectful. We, we, we've fallen in love with them. We have friends who are our guides in Israel who are not messianic believers but we, we, we grow to love them and we work well with them and they're very respectful. But from the very beginning, when we went to Israel, you know, back in 1983, the first time we went, we, we would see the guide, if he was not a messianic, we saw the guide, whenever the word was being taught, uh, would walk away. They will walk away. So if you're sharing something, your guide isn't necessarily going to be there. He will walk away and speak to the bus driver or maybe speak to other guides while you're at a certain site. So we saw that often for a long time. Every time we would begin to, to share, we'd see the guide walk away. They wouldn't listen to us. But one day, we had a new guide. We were in the city of Capernaum, and I was teaching a Bible study in the synagogue, a synagogue in Capernaum, the ruins of a synagogue, a very early uh, synagogue. And as I was sharing, I could see off to my side that our guide stayed to listen, which is unusual. They usually don't. They usually walk away. And I'm used to that. But this particular guide stuck around and listened. And you could see that he was listening. Now, as you're sharing, there's a thousand and one thoughts that could go in your mind. You could be thinking, this man here, he knows his New Testament. I mean, this guy would walk up to me and say, we're going to be at this site right now. You might want to use Luke chapter 7 here. I mean, he knows his New Testament, and he can say, this, is, this, this passage works here. They'll do that with you. They know it, but they don't know the author. They don't know Christ. So I'm watching this guy, and we're just getting to know him. And I share some thoughts about Jesus and all, and how important it is to follow him, and, and, and all of that. And here we are in Capernaum. And when I finish, he walks up, and he steps to my side, and he goes, hey, I'll never forget this. He goes, what he just said is true. He went like that. What he just said is true. And, and then he started adding to my message. And I'm looking at this guy. He's a Jewish guy. 
And I turn to Marie, and I give her that old husband look with the wife, like, what's happening here? I don't know. <laughs> that kind of look. And later on, Marie and I are talking, and I said, did you see that? She goes, I've never seen that before. I said, I've never, I have never seen that, where they will listen. He listened, and he was so moved by it, he wanted to give his second part of the message. Interesting. Well, he became very dear to us. He got to know my kids. He got to know us. We began asking for him to go with us every year as our guide. And over time, he became my friend. So fast forward to several years, and we're now driving, and we're on the bus. And when you take a trip to Israel, you're in an area that is where Jericho is. Some of you have been to Israel, so you're coming from Jericho. And you're moving towards, is, you're going towards Jerusalem. And as you're going towards Jerusalem, you're going to get to a, a, a tunnel. And the bus, at that time, the bus driver slows the bus down because we're about to enter into Jerusalem for the first time. For many people who've never been to Jerusalem, this will be their introduction. So they slow the bus down for a dramatic effect to give you an opportunity to begin to prepare your heart because you are coming into the, the city of the great king. It's very moving. And your, uh, your bus driver will put on a song on Jeru about Jerusalem. And before you know it, we're all singing a song we've never heard before. But it's, it's oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, blah, 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 blah. And we're, everybody starts singing. Now they're getting like caught up because we're about to enter into the city. And then at that point, the guide will begin to speak. And he will say, this is the city of Jerusalem. And he starts giving the history of it. Now, we're, we're still in the tunnel. And he starts to give you the history of Jerusalem. He gets to King David. It is where King David ruled. And it is the city of Jesus Christ. And when he says that, as believers, you're going, man, I'm coming into the city of Jesus that Jesus was in. There's something about that. People cry. The bus, there's a lot of people on the, in the bus crying. And, and I'll eventually, I'll point to the left. I'll say, look this way. Because as you come out of the, the tunnel, the city springs out in front of you. And off to your left, you see the Temple Mount. You see Jerusalem, right? So, my guide is speaking. And the music's played. And we're preparing our hearts to see the city when he said something like this, this is Jerusalem, an ancient city where God's presence has been, where the temple was, and all the sacrifice, and he begins to share. Then he says, it is, the t it is the city of the great King David. It is the city of your Messiah. And then he said this, and my Messiah. We go, oh. Wow. So Marie's next to me, and I look at her like, did I hear that? So he and I later on, like I said, we're friends. We're having a cup of coffee together. He says, you know that there's a man here, and this man has since died, but he said, I believe he's dead. I believe he died. He goes, you know there's a man who's being presented here as being Messiah. I said, I've seen that because they have banners up. And it says, the Messiah has come. It was all over Jerusalem, by the Western Wall, all over. He says, you know, that he claims to be Messiah. And I said, uh, yeah, I'm aware of that. He goes, he sends people out door to door. They go door to door here in Jerusalem, because my friend lives in Jerusalem. He said, they go door to door, and they came to my door the other day. I said, really? We're having a conversation, really? He goes, yeah. He says, they knocked on the door. I opened it up. They said, Messiah has, has come. And he said, do you know what I told him? And I said, no, what did you tell him? He said, I told him, why would I believe in your Messiah when the true one came 2,000 years ago? And I go, oh. So he had crossed over. He crossed over. He's a follower of Jesus Christ now. And our bus driver, I have a dear friend. His name is Avi. We always have Avi drive us. Avi's a, a sweet man. And Avi came to faith in Christ 
Jewish man came to faith in Christ because he used to drive Pastor Chuck Smith. And he would hear Chuck speak. And one day he said, this man is speaking the truth. And he is a follower of Christ. And he's become very, very dear to Marie and me. He's a dear friend to us. And see, the veil is taken away. Before, when someone hasn't come to faith in Christ, Paul says there's a veil. It's hiding Christ from them. But when they come to faith in Christ, that veil, as he says, is taken away. Verse 16, when one turns to the Lord, that veil is taken away. And we have seen that take place in the life of friends of ours there in Israel. And then finally, he says, verse 17, the Lord is the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And so God, by His grace, He's saying, gives us freedom from the power of and, power of and the bondage of, of sin. It, it breaks the bondage of the yoke of the law. In John 8, 32, Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So this liberty that we have it is not so we can continue to sin. This liberty is to be free of its ruling our lives. In Romans 6, 1 and 2, Paul said it like this, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? He didn't give me his grace to continue in sin. His grace set me free from it. The law never did. The law awakened in me bondage. The law awakened in me judgment. But Jesus Christ came to bring me truth. And it's the truth that sets you free. And so wherever the Spirit lives and works, there's liberty. Not only from Jewish bondage, but from the slavery of sin. From its power, from its guilt, and from its pollution. We've been given grace from God, and we have freedom that comes with it. We didn't receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. We received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. We are children of God. And so he says in verse 18, we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord we see the promises and privileges of the gospel without turning away. We have an unobstructed view, like, look when, like when we see ourselves clearly in a mirror, and we're being transformed, and his glory doesn't fade from us. It's a continual, progressive work of transformation. We are being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And in 1 John 3, 2 and 3, John said it like this, Beloved, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. The Holy Spirit is working in you. He's removing things from you, things that, that don't belong in heaven, things that are not to be there. He's removing those things from you. Your life is being set apart. It's being sanctified as you walk in the Spirit, as you love His Word, as you put it into practice, you're being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. What a beautiful thing to think about, how God is taking you from glory to glory. You are changed. Your friends knew you in one way. Five years later, they look at you and say, what happened to you? What changed you? And you say, it's the power of God. It's the glory of Christ. He changes lives. That's what changed me. I didn't become religious. I didn't become a religious man. I just am walking with Jesus Christ. He changes your life. I'm not in love with, a, with Calvary Chapel. I'm not in love with a, 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 a system. I'm in love with the Savior. And that relationship has changed me. That's how it works. The Lord is the Spirit. We don't have the law anymore. We have God's grace. The law still finds a place in our life we still don't covet. We still don't commit adultery. We still do not kill. We still do not steal. But these are things that are being done because our character is being transformed and we're becoming more like Jesus. Jesus didn't do any of those things and his children, his brothers and sisters don't either. 
by his powerful Holy Spirit living within us, we are being changed from grace to grace, from glory to glory. It, it, it does not yet appear what we uh, shall be, but, but one day we will be conformed into his image. One day, one day we will be like him, complete in him. We will see him face to face and we'll enter into this promise of, of heaven and uh, we will not regret one moment uh, of this life. We will not regret one moment of giving up sin because look, look at what we've gained. Look at what we got. We get to be in heaven with Jesus Christ. Oh, how I look forward to that. I really do.